Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to part two of classic bands, most ridiculed songs here at the Fun House on Friday morning alongside Martin Popoff on this cold and chilly November morning on a Friday. Absolutely, yes. Definitely that way here, too. The snow tires go on early next week, and uh, yeah, it's uh, Toronto, Toronto definitely has the big winters. So yeah, freezing cold up here, too. Three days in a row in New York are frost on the ground. Yeah. And uh, yeah. three days in a row, I had to bring in plants from the outside patio that we forgot to bring in. And I don't know if they're going to make it now because they got that little bit of frost burn, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'll see. I, I noticed like that we have this kind of cool cactus. Uh, it's like an assortment of cactus plants that my mother gave us uh, when we built the patio. And, and it was looking great all summer long in the early <laughs> fall. And I took all the other ones in this morning. I'm going out back and I'm like, oh, how did I forget this one? And I noticed like half of it's not looking good. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, well. <laughs> the problem when you have too much stuff going on, you forget the little things. And that's bringing plants in from outdoors when it, the weather gets cold is one of the little things, I think. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so today we've got part two of what has proven to be a pretty popular topic. So these are songs from, you know, very notable classic bands that, and let's, I guess we'll need to clarify it again, because I think, you know, some people uh, thought that we were kind of just crapping all over these songs and then we were labeling them the worst songs from these bands. Not necessarily. These are just songs that, you know, when these albums came out and either they released these as singles or they were deep cut or they had a video or they played them live, either us, the young hardcore hard rock and metal fans scoffed at them laughed them or, or maybe the critics did or you know journalists did whatever there was at the time there was some mud thrown at these particular songs from various parts of the fan base or the, uh, the journalistic world so to speak that doesn't mean to say that we haven't grown to love some of these songs over time maybe we still don't like them uh, I, I went over a lot of my picks last night and thinking, yeah, I, I can deal with quite a few of these songs. But at the time, they were ridiculed by either us, people we knew, or people in much higher spaces than us. So uh, we've each picked five bands like we did last week, and uh, we've got five examples for each. So I'm going to have Martin kick us off with his first band selection of the day. Okay, and before I get started, I want to thank you for uh, reviewing the Nazareth book. That was very cool of you. Thank you very uh, much. Nice. Well, hopefully I, I did get some notes that some people did place orders. So that's Yes, totally yeah, right. definitely, definitely. And that intro was perfect because my first selection by a little band you might uh, have heard of called ACDC yeah. um, fits that to a T. This was a ridiculed song. So my first selection is from Power Age, and it's uh, Rock and Roll Damnation. and uh, you know, what you just said is is like perfect because this is now one of my favorite ACDC songs of all time. But when it came out, it was an advanced single. And I absolutely, me and the buddies all ridiculed it because, you know, and I've been playing Let There Be Rock lately. Um, it, it is actually much poppier and much mellower and much more melodic than anything on Let There Be Rock. So we were kind of horrified about it. It's got a little extra percussion in it and stuff. So definitely it was ridiculed and there was some time to ridicule it because it was an advanced single, right? Um, so there was a lot of discussion about it, not the same way there is now with the internet, but you know, uh, old school analog discussion, I suppose. Um, so my second selection uh, from ACDC is, uh, is Rock and Roll Ain't Noise Pollution. Um, again, uh, this was an album. The funny thing about early ACDC is ridicule is not a word that really goes with them all that well because you were laughing along with them. They were cool. Bond was cool. When they were joking around and doing, you know, uh, big balls or the jack or whatever, it was just it was just funny and it wasn't it, there was nothing to ridicule about them. But as they got bigger and as you know, it, it started to creep in that maybe they're kind of like can be a little bit awkward with their phrasing, like something like rock and roll ain't noise pollution or possibly starting to lack for ideas, which is an insane thing to say about one of the biggest albums, uh, biggest selling albums of all time. Uh, but that song is definitely the song on that album that was a little bit of their uh, quest for fire, you know, peace of mind kind of song. It was one that, that uh, you know, it, to me, it's a, it's a Gene Simmons bass farts song. It's like, dun, 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 dun. you know, it's just, it's just slow and awkward and coagulated and, and just the title sounds like a Scorpion song. Right. Um, and then after that, uh, it, it kind of picked up. 
Um, my third selection is Let's Get It Up from ACDC. Uh, I mean, ACDC from uh, from For Those About to Rock. And uh, and it felt a little little more like they were having more songs like that. And, you, and, you know, Let's Get It Up. It's like, what, what, a bunch of guys together? Let's get it up. I mean, what's going on here you know, yeah. in this? In this like, and, it, and it's just like, this stuff is coming off the top of their head with a little thought. That's the way it, it kind of started to feel uh, later on with ACDC. So that was a little bit of a, uh, and, and, you know, it's like, do, 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 do. You know, it's just like the music was also, you know, getting more relaxed and more and more brown and puffy and, and, and not as heavy and as edgy as it used to be. And, and it was definitely starting to feel that way. You move on to, um, fly in the wall and you've got sink the pink right which which again it's like you're going oh brother here we go you know the 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 sexual double entendre thing but they're just daring you to hate them right and and this album was quite maligned um but you know it goes sink the pink it's all the fashion right it's like pink and fashion don't really go together and no. none of it goes with acdc no. either right and then it's drink the drink it's old-fashioned right it's like what are you guys talking about right and it's, and it's just not a great song that's not well recorded and brian can't sing and all that kind of stuff um moving on i wanted to pick something later and i definitely wanted to pick something from ball breaker because um you know there are there are actually three on here cover you in oil right it's like, hmm, really? Cover you in oil? Is that is that is that how this is going to play out? It's like ridiculous, right? And at the same time, you've got Hard as a Rock, which is, which is you know, this is like the big flagship song on it. And again, it sounds like a Scorpions title. It sounds like something Herman or, or Klaus might say, right? Yep. Um, and, uh, oh, man. And then you've got The Fuhrer and you've got Hail Caesar. And all these Caesar and ACDC doesn't go together. So this no. had a lot. But but um, if I was to pick one, I'll, I'll go with Cover You in Oil from that. And, uh, and that's pretty much, I mean, I had, I also had as honorable mentions, Money Talks and Mistress for Christmas, which again, silly. And it's not a good idea really to put a Christmas song on your actual, you know, bona fide official studio album. So, you know, ringing the bells and all that kind of stuff in, in that. So, uh, so there you go. My, my five rock and roll damnation, rock and roll ain't noise pollution. Let's get it up. Sink the pink and uh, cover you in oil. Yeah. Those are all great choices. I think, you know, you got to wonder if like ACDC was doing that intentionally or not. It's like, we're going to be kind of sly and cheeky just because we can, because we're ACDC, but it, it comes off in a way where it's like puzzling for the listener, you know, not only, you know, the, the song titles, the lyrics, it's just like, this is just like really silly. Like maybe that's the way they intended it. I don't know, but uh, yeah, those are great. Show yeah, cover yeah. me in oil. <laughs> uh, all right, my first band of the day. Uh, I'm going with Kiss. We're going to start off with a bang here. So we're going to go all the way back to the first album, a song called "Kissing Time." <sighs> Cause any time is a kissing time. USA. I know they didn't write this song, but yeah. Jesus Christ. I mean, uh, baby, get ready because I'll be kissing you. I kind of like the heavy metal stomping riff they got in there. Yeah, yeah, the song yeah. is so ludicrous. It's like, you know, and, and it doesn't fit on that album. You remember, I, you, Mark, you remember being a kid and like loving those early Kiss albums because they're kind of dark and the songs are really serious and that yeah. first album and then you come to that song and you're like, where did this come from? It's like, yeah. you can't tell me that they're short on material that they had to include that. So, uh, you know, it's kind of lighthearted, I guess, and breaks up that album. And like I said, I, and you, you talked about the, the Gene Simmons ridiculous bass riff before, right? I, I, it's perfect for that song. It's such like a basic, just big piece of nonsense, but it's kind of lovable in its just ridiculousness, I guess. So that's my first choice. Uh, then the obvious choice, we're going to go to Destroyer. Well, one of a couple obvious ones here. Uh, Beth. Now, this is a weird one. Uh, so because this was a huge song for them, 
And this is the song that all of a sudden, oh, well, the ladies kind of like Kiss now, right? So it's not just, you know, the, the, young, the young boys wearing makeup. Now all of a sudden the girls like it because this song is just absolutely amazing. And this is, like a, this is like the more than words example, right? So all of a sudden, how many, how many young girls back in the day went out and bought Destroyer because they heard that song on the radio and then they listened to like God of Thunder and Sweet Pain and all these other songs They're like, well, wait a second. That doesn't sound like that. That doesn't sound like that lovely song with the strings and the piano and all that kind of stuff. So the chicks loved it. All of us Kiss fans, I mean, after like the initial couple of times, you know, because I will admit I was one of those kids that sang along to Peter back when that song first came out. But after a while, I'm like, this sucks. This is not what I want to hear uh, Kiss doing at all. But you know what? It helped them move a lot of copies of the album. The single sold a lot. And to this day, I think it's their hardest, highest chart and single ever, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, whatever. Um, number three. Uh, we're going to go back to another cover song from the Love Gun album. The last song on the album. Nothing like ending your album with a bang with Then She Kissed Me. Like, these guys should not be doing covers, first of all. Uh, and, and you save it for the last song. What about like, and, I mean, how many of their albums have great last songs? And then this. And then she kissed me. I mean, it's just no good. I hated it back in the day. Everybody I knew hated it back in the day. I still think everybody hates it because no, when was the last time anybody talked about their version of Then She Kissed Me? Yeah. Anybody? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, forget it. Yeah. No good. Uh, and then the other super obvious one. Uh, I was made for loving you off of Dynasty. Yeah. All of us rockers, you know, we were all, and the critics were like, Kiss has gone disco. What is this? Squeaky clean, the flashy video. You know, Paul looking at the camera with that smile on his face. Doo, 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 doo. It's just so ridiculous. I do like the song, however. <laughs> but yeah, Desmond Child strikes again, right? Boom. Uh, but a big song for them. Uh, but ultimately, it kind of, you know, in a way, really almost kind of stalled or killed their career because I think that momentum that they had going was wearing thin by that point. But, you know, it's still one of their bigger hits uh, ever. But man, that got a lot of shit back in the day because I, I think that uh, folks thought Kiss would do anything but go disco. But they did it okay, I guess. I don't know. And then last but not least, kind of an extension of I Was Made for Loving You shandy from unmasked <laughs> so now kiss they're not going to go disco now now they're going to go well you know what there's, there's these kind of cool soft rock bands what we now call yacht rock bands you know player ambrosia the doobie brothers steely dan we're going to do that too catchy tune right shandy's kind of a catchy tune but is it is it kiss that's debatable uh and i i remember you know we were already on the fence with kiss when Unmasked came out and then they released that as a single. And I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm off the kiss train. And I didn't come back till, uh, you know, creatures of the night, obviously. But uh, yeah, so those are my five kiss in time, death. Then she kissed me. I was made for loving you and Shandy. A lot of mud slinging went the way of those songs over the years. So yeah. yeah. There you have it. Yeah. And it's funny. And if you go forward, they almost do the ACDC thing where they've got like, let's, let's put the X back in sex and uh, all night and all that kind of stuff that they're just like forcing you to go. Oh, I could have done 10 for kiss. Cause yeah, I didn't yeah. even touch the, the unmakeup years. Right. Because exactly. there are plenty yeah, of yeah. men too. Yeah. yeah. They, they had, they have enough to cover all the errors, believe me. So. Yeah, yeah. And then it's funny, you know, later in the career, ACDC and kiss combined, it's like, it's like there's the, it's a combination of nobody really knows these songs all that well to make fun of them. And also you're almost like, there's too many to, to maybe like they're, you know, they're, they're not as big. They're not on top anymore. And, and you don't feel like, you know, you, you just can't get a right. You know, you can't rise to the challenge of picking something. Cause there's so many of them, right? I mean, you touched yeah. on that last week with the Scorpions yeah. choice. I mean, the Scorpions yeah. have so many on the latter part of the career. It's like, you know, the same thing with kiss with ACDC. There's a lot of kind of dumb songs. Right. And it's just like, yeah. is that just the, where they're at now? Right. It's like, you know, yeah. we're just going to do the songs we're going to do. We're not going to give too much thought about it. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting yeah. topic. Right. Love that first Scorpion single, though, Peacemaker, and love that album cover. We've been talking about it on my Facebook. Yeah, like, I listened too to much the almost. Twice. You know? The yeah. first song I listened to it, I was like, ah, this is okay. Then yeah. I listened to it again, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? It's kind of, 
it's kind of molten. I kind of dig it. And I, yeah. I, I think I like it because Matias sounds great on it. And yeah. even Klaus is singing pretty good. I'm like, this is not bad because yeah. I really haven't liked anything the Scorpions have done in a long time. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'll, I'm interested in hearing more. You know, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure about the album cover yet, Martin, but uh, I'm working yeah. on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My second choice is Van Halen. Um, now, the funny thing is, I, I thought early on, there's not really anything that they're so cool that you're not ridiculing anything early on, on, on a lot of those early albums. And I thought, you know, was there some ridicule for you're no good, beautiful girls, women in love on two, maybe a little bit, a little bit, you know, thinking, especially, especially beautiful girls and, and even women in love. But again, you think Van Halen is so cool that they're geniuses and that they know what they're doing. So they're above ridicule sort of thing. The ridicule starts coming in with, this album, when they do Roy Orbison's Oh Pretty Woman, I mean, there's a lot of ridicule for that, um, that, that they just, that they, they think so much of themselves that they can just go back and do this and, and we're all going to think it's great. We don't want to hear Van Halen do covers at all, but here they are doing cut covers. And then they um, also do Dancing in the Street, which just, again, doesn't seem like a Van Halen song. They do it kind of cool with that bubbly sort of, uh, you know, uh, riff that Eddie comes up with. But definitely, I remember tons and tons of ridicule for those off of this. Uh, and then later on, when you get to the likes of your, uh, you know, the 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 love walks in and the and the finish what you started that's that's two different things but love walks in can't stop loving you off of balance there was definitely a lot of ridicule for the really saccharine ballads from sammy hager um but finish what you started definitely was in for a lot of ridicule as well for that for that just you know the bluesy are we cinderella or something here kind of kind of like you know acoustic oh we're we're like uh you know we're like authentic uh southern blues rockers or something you know and finish what you started just shows how bluesy we are oh my god we're so bluesy right um so uh and what let's see so so my official ones were pretty woman dancing in the street love walks in finish what you started and then i end with um Tattoo from this was quite ridiculed when it came out. I don't really, you know, I I, I think it it is integrated okay into the album. It's uh, it's different from the rest of the album, um, but it's it's uh, it's a little bit kind of like um, David Lee Roth just being a little bit too smart and sassy and the whole tat and the lyrics. Um, you know, the music was, there's no real riff to the music. It's just a big surging sort of power chord kind of thing. Um, you know, the rest of the album was heavier and more guitar-y sort of feeling than that song. But again, advanced single, we all had time to complain and grouse about Van Halen for a little bit. It's something we all love to do. Um, and Tattoo was definitely up for some ridicule. People were going, oh, brother, what is this album going to sound like? Yep, um, yep. You know, D David Lee Roth, it was always too big for his britches. He, he, he was always amused by his own wordplay. And, uh, and that song really felt that way. And frankly, a lot of the rest of the album felt that way as well. But then Eddie drowned him out with all those great riffs and we love this record. So, um, so there you go. Uh, as honorable mentions, three, there was nothing to pick from three because the whole thing is a dumpster fire. Uh, but Big Fat Money from Balance is another one that I recall getting in for a little bit of ridicule because of its stupid title. And, and again, it's just not, not a great song. So uh, there you go, Van Halen. Yeah, I mean, Tattoo, another example, we talked about it last week, where, you know, they, a band or a record label releases a first single, and it's like the worst song on the album. And, and you, I mean, because I, when I, I, I was with you, when I heard that song, I still don't like it. I was like, oh my God, this is the way the rest of the album is going to sound. We're in trouble. And the rest of the album kills. So it's like, what was the purpose of releasing that piece of garbage first when you've got all these other great songs to get people because how many people did not buy that album because they heard that song yeah it's interesting yeah, yeah. It's, it makes no sense to me i anyway. think there's a pretty big swanky video for it too right yeah 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 so yeah yeah, yeah interesting yeah. all right my next uh band of choice here today is yes yes it's yes uh okay. prog rock legends They've got their share of songs that have been ridiculed over the years. So my first choice, we're going to go back to the Tormato album because, you know, yes, we're uh, that's probably their first like mediocre album. 
Well, you know what? Let me hold up. Nah, I'll, I'll save it for last. There is an album I'm going to go to before that. But Tormato is the first like really true uh, mediocre album where people were kind of like, all right, has Yes kind of like stalled? Have they kind of hit their peak? You know, what's the deal? Uh, the song, there's a couple songs you could have picked on here, but the one that seems to get the most uh, ridicule, gets the most jabs at is Circus of Heaven. Uh, definitely one of the weaker tracks on the album. It's got some nice vocal layers from John Anderson, but man, is it unfocused musically. It's got all this really weird blips and bleeps from Wakeman who sounds like he'd rather be doing anything else but be in Yes at the time and the whole song just comes across as really pretentious and you know that's one of the things that like you know critics always called prog these prog legends back in the day it's like all oh, the music is so bombastic and pretentious and and bigger than it needs to be and then you listen to a song like this and you're like yeah that's exactly how this song sounds right it's just like what happened to the, the Yes we can kind of you know get into and all that sort of thing so circus heaven first one uh next one we're going to go to 90125 owner of a lonely heart so again a huge hit for the band a huge album for the band band with broken up now they're back with this kind of weirdly different lineup trevor rabin and you know uh, tony k's back in the band you got chris squire alan white and john anderson comes back in the band but they have a song owner of a lonely heart which doesn't sound anything like classic yes so all the classic fans were like what is this this is not, this is this slick poppy, you know, hard rock guitars. Yes. Uh, but all the non-yes fans who couldn't be bothered with the pretentious 70s prog rock stuff loved it. So go figure. The band though, these days seems bored to tears playing it, but you know, it's their biggest hit of all time. So go figure. Uh, part two of that is the Rhythm of Love from Big Generator. Yes, West at its most anti-classic yes. Hard rock, arena rock riffs, never a good fit in the set. I mean, all those years that I would go see yes, like with that album and, and the next decade after it, they would always play that in the set. And that's always like, oh, okay, that song. All right, time to go to the bathroom and go get a beer. So uh, never a favorite of the old school yes fans. But again, uh, did fairly well on FM rock radio in the day. Uh, next up, we're going to go to the Union album. All right, which kind of a mess, supposed to be a meeting of all of the ex yes members or most of them anyway, doing an album together. Of course, later on, we find out that hardly any of them recorded anything together. It was all these studio players and mix mash this and that uh, saving my heart. So, yes, doing Caribbean reggae flavors. Yeah, please stop, guys. We, we don't need that. No. Uh, last but not least, now we're going to go back in time. And this. Uh, this one's kind of a stretch, but uh, the remembering from Tales from Topographic Oceans. You either love Topographic Oceans or you hate it. And quite frankly, you could probably pick any song from that album. Uh, each of the four tracks is long, gargantuan, truly immense, undecipherable lyrics, uh, really complicated musically, you know, it, it's just one of those albums that you, you, like I said, you either really get or you don't, and you have to be in the mood to listen to or not. Uh, critics savaged it, radio shunned it, and Rick Wakeman left the band because of it. There you have it. <laughs> nice, yeah. Yeah, Circus of Heaven sounds like it's being played by elves, right? Yeah, it's just like, it's <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's too much. It's just, it's yeah. way too much. And those are all for different reasons, right? Which is pretty interesting, right? Yeah. You know, some are too big, you know, the, the, the Caribbean that has, I think that has kind of the, uh, the, the Rosanna Toto beat to it, doesn't it? Yeah. See the Something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. like you snap your fingers to it and there's Trevor Raven singing in the background. Yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I would have waited forever. That, that one is that, is that Union? Is that, is that Anderson Bruford Wakeman or is that Yes Union? I, I always get those two albums mixed up. Uh, but that, that one is definitely another one. Wow. Me. Now, now I have to, I have to check. Yeah. Cause that's yeah. either on one or the other album. Like, hold on. I'll tell you in a second, Martin. Hold on. Uh, that's actually not and a Tales, of course. That's yeah, but it's uh, it definitely was in for a little ridicule, right? I remember. Oh, I yeah, time. yeah. It's just too hooky, right? Too poppy, too It's hooky. really hooky, yeah. I mean, it, it's not a terrible song. So let's see. Yeah, yeah. Union, where are we? Where are we? That is and, the, first song, on, it's the first song on Union. Yeah, that is basically Union, yes. uh, Anderson, Wakeman, Bluford, Howe, I guess. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. But it's from that album. Maybe. All right. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, my next one is Queen. Um, we definitely know Queen has some songs that are in for some ridicule, but actually, well, actually, they do have a lot, and most of them are in the 80s. I mean, you we were not ridiculing Queen. Again, it's that same thing that they were so cool, you thought they were geniuses, so when they did, like, lazing on a Sunday afternoon, it wasn't particularly ridiculed. It was like, they're geniuses, they must know what they're doing, yeah. right? Uh, that kind of thing, right? Um, but definitely when you get to, uh, you know, the, the two most obvious, there's three huge obvious choices, and we've got Crazy Little Thing Called Love was greatly ridiculed because uh, why does Queen think that they're they're suddenly, uh, you know, like uh, skiffle rockabilly guys, because yeah. uh, they never, never acted like it before, so it just seemed dumb. Uh, and then you've got the big disco song on here, Another One Bites the Dust, hugely, hugely ridiculed. There was the big, huge backlash against disco at the time, and that was the most overtly flagrant disco song out of out of all these guys trying disco, right? You know, we talked about the Kiss song earlier, um, but then you move on. Uh, Radio Gaga is a, another huge one with just that ridiculous title, ridiculous chorus that doesn't mean much of anything, and it's literally a disco song and a synth rock song at the same time. Which, which are two things that drive people crazy. Um, but it's, it's got really cool chord structure and sequence to it. It's a pretty cool song. I, I, I kind of like it. Yeah, and live um, it's great. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it sounds more powerful. Um, and then uh, you get to a kind of magic when you get up into this. And this is Queen doing their almost like yacht rock housewifey ballad thing. And, uh, you know, everything about this record was just kind of a disaster from the, from the cover art on down. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, you can pick something like The Invisible Man um, from The Miracle. You know, you're the invisible man. I'm the invisible man. Invisible man. <laughs> uh, see right through you. You know, that little soulful kind of like vocal thing that goes on. Um, so, yeah, very annoying melodies and everything about, you yeah, know, and this is when Queen has more or less lost, lost the plot and you don't have confidence in them and you do feel that they are in, in for some ridicule because they're huge, huge stars and they can take it. That's the other dimension of this ridiculing thing, right? You don't ridicule, you know, you don't ridicule things when they're, when they're you know, when they're down or small or whatever, or can't help it or don't have, you know, the faculties. You know, you can ridicule Queen because they were absolutely on top of the world, you know, uh, you know starting essentially in about 1975 right uh they, they were a huge huge band so so those are the ones uh innuendo i didn't feel there was really anything you could ridicule uh, uh up into those years you know these are the days of our lives maybe delilah that that kind of thing um i want to break break free was in for quite a bit of ridicule because of the uh the drag video uh hot space almost has too many targets um that uh you know everybody was too too like horrified and poured out and and despaired to to even think you know ridicule was was like too too small a word to to use uh, across i think you, do, you didn't even want to be caught discussing that album right yeah, exactly there you go that's, that's that's the best way to put it you know and people have mentioned things like was mustafa um ridiculed off of off of jazz maybe a little bit because it's it's really really odd and and almost silly and then fat bottom girls but fat bottom girls wasn't really ridiculed i i i don't really feel i love the song um you know it's more like we're laughing along with you uh it's that same thing as the early acdc and it's just a fun cool song so I, I don't really feel that that even jazz had much in for ridicule so so there you go crazy little thing called love another one bites the dust radio gaga a kind of magic and the invisible man cool i just had body language get into my head Please get it out quickly yeah. now. Uh, <laughs> give me my body. It's like, oh, no, stop, stop. All right. Uh, my, my next band, uh, I wore the hoodie today for a reason. Uh, Sticks. Going to go to Sticks now for my next choices here. Uh, so the first one, you know, the early stuff, not a lot of ridicule with those albums because, A, they, they weren't really a big band. Then all of a sudden, you know, they start releasing albums like uh, Equinox and... Um, um grand illusion and you know pieces of eight and so on and so forth and you know all great songs on those really serious stuff it wasn't really until they came out with the cornerstone album that we started to see you know people throwing shit at the band <clears throat> and specifically so you got this huge hit on the album again it's kind of like the Beth thing all over again so they released babe which is this kind of throwaway track that dennis DeYoung wrote about his wife and uh 
The chicks loved it. Okay. All of us guys hated it. Uh, the radio stations ate it up. It was played everywhere. It became a massive hit, helped the band get even bigger than they were. Uh, and they helped the album, you know, to multi-platinum status. So, uh, and, you know, as we know, see in history, the rest of the band didn't like it because they refused to play it. And once Dennis was no longer in the group, so uh, got a per- bit of ridicule, you know, across the board. But as we've seen a lot of these songs, even the ones that get ridiculed, a lot of them still do really well for themselves. So, you know, go figure. Uh, I'm going to stay on that album. We got one more from Cornerstone. Why me? Which is a really strange album. And I remember back in the day, you know, us listening to that album, we're like, all right, so here's this kind of like weird, funky song with a sax solo. Because back then, right, if you were, we did not want to hear saxophone and we didn't want to hear any of our hard rock and metal bands using sax. That was like sacrilegious. So, like, what gives here? Um, you know, just after Babe and that. I mean, I was left thinking, is this band selling out? Are they going pop? What's the deal here? Well, we'll see, right? So then we've got uh, two albums later, we've got this album called Kilroy was here and a song called Mr. Roboto, which is the band doing this really wacky, weird synth pop, Domo Origato, Mr. Roboto, Domo, 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 Domo. It's just, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I think most of us kind of wrote the band off at that point in time, though again, the single did well. The album did really well. All right. They went out and toured, sold lots of tickets for that. So go figure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, how many how many critics savaged sticks saying they created one of the worst concept albums of all time? Right. So it took a lot of shit. Uh, then we uh, also stay on the same album. Don't let it end again. Another Dennis DeYoung kind of syrupy, saccharine ballad. Uh, is he trying to turn this band into a ballad machine? Kind of seemed that way. Right. But Don't Let It End did really well as a single. People still like that song, so go figure. Uh, And the last one is kind of a weird one, but I remember at the time, I think many of us were a little shocked by it. Uh, Love is the Ritual from Edge of the Century. So Tommy Shaw is gone off to his damn Yankees, right? Uh, They bring in this guy named Glenn Burtnick, who had the look, good singer, played guitar, right? Wrote a lot of songs, who brings this kind of like hair metal track to the band. I mean, you listen to the song, it's got all the kind of late 80s, early 90s, you know, the drums sound, you know, ridiculous and overproduced. And it's got this kind of winger like chorus and the big hair metal guitars, kind of a fun song. Most of them were kind of like, what the hell is this? You know, critics were like, all right, is the the new blood going to take sticks down this this new direction now? We'll wait and see. But as you know, the 90s proved this band was, you know, people coming and going, coming and going. Is is Dennis in? Is Tommy in? Are they both in? Are neither one of them in? What's going on here? So, uh, yeah, love is the ritual. Don't let it end. Mr. Roboto, why me and Babe are my choices for sticks. Nice. I think I think Mr. Roboto is probably gonna gonna win the uh, the top of all fifty of these uh, these songs. Probably, yeah. Ridiculous. It's yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty ridiculous. But you <laughs> know what? Ridiculous. But everybody loves it now because it's just the yeah. Most you know what it is, Martin? I, Mr. Roboto to me is kind of like Turbo Lover, like Turbo yeah. for for yeah. Priest. Because yeah. now, man, you go to see Priest live, and when they play Turbo Lover, people lose their minds. Like it's yeah. the greatest pre-song ever done. Yeah. yeah. Has have the years been kind to these kind of silly songs? I I guess. Yeah. You know, even Come Sail Away and Sticks in general, Sticks in general is the same as Come Sail Away. It, it's just this whole thing about Sticks kind of the way they look, the way they were corporate rock, the way they dressed. Um, the way they're like, like the most sort of like giddy, ethereal pump rock of all time. Come sail the way. Re- remember, remember uh, when uh, South Park did that? It was a big deal, right? And and so they came into some new ridicule uh, at that point. But but st- you know, a song like that represents that era. And and obviously everybody was also jealous of Sticks because they were so huge. I remember as kids we felt that way. But so yeah, I mean, to, to me that song is almost like a metaphor for for the ridicule of the band itself. Yeah, yeah, and, and they're one of those bands too that I think some of the tracks that I mentioned uh, for like those who maybe weren't listening to Sticks, like the early you know heavier stuff, the more progressive stuff. Uh, all they remember are these really bad, you know, well, not bad, but they remember these massive selling overplayed ballads that were on the radio and the weird Mr. Roboto song. They're like, oh, Sticks, they were always so horrible. But yet they 
all they really know are those handful of tracks that are really not that indicative of what the band was all about but that's the image that was portrayed that's what was played on the radio so yeah i mean and, and there's a lot of bands that we can say that about right that's what happens when when radio or mtv just kind of give you one portrayal of of who a band is or should be when in actuality there there's a lot more going on there than just that yeah all right my next choice is alice cooper which is kind of a funny one um but you know i found a few it's interesting so the first two albums are very ridiculed in total but nobody really knows any of the songs as you move on it's like this band will try and do everything um they aren't that heavy they they have a sense of humor alice is a charming kind of guy he doesn't have huge airs about him they're not a super serious band so you're not ridiculing any of the big hits from the golden era um the ridicule, I remember as kids and in the press a little bit, started coming with this album, which is a little overblown, a little overproduced. So the title track, Welcome to My Nightmare, which is kind of a doorsy, funky song. Um, and then Some Folks, which is, you know, the, the finger snapping, like swing sort of song. So that came in for a little bit of ridicule. Um, and then you move on to this era where he's got the likes of... Uh, the 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 housewifey power ballad uh, not even power ballad just ballads um yeah. when you get into uh, i never cry from this album and uh, and especially you and me from this album um so you get that that um that kiss bath more than words uh thing happening at that point um and then moving on um clones we're all clones um from flush the fashion which we actually did a contrarians episode and marco argued that as his favorite alice cooper album and I, and I quite like it a lot as well in total but that song was in for a lot of abuse because it has a lot of that that cars thing to it that gary newman thing the big prominent synthesizer line to it you know the alice trying to be you know scientifically uh, at the front edge with talking about clones so it's kind of this topical thing about it it's got a silly beat and it's kind of sing-songy so that one was in for a lot of abuse and even talk talk the cover of the music machines talk talk from that got in for some abuse as well and just just general the, generally the whole uh, i'm trying to be modern uh, kind of thing and then you move up into the likes of poison uh, from this, you know, a lot of people were ridiculing uh, Alice in this phase because it's the cleaned up hair metal phase rather than, you know, the, the first two MCA albums. You got your your constrictor and raise your fist and yell where it was kind of like heavier and more of a kiss thing. And now it's getting into a more of a Bon Jovi, uh, you know, Aerosmith poisony poison kind of thing. Uh, and that song was just a little over dramatic, melodramatic. And again, some jealousy that Alice is probably doing well at this point. Yeah. But um, we, we are really feeling um, not liking that uh, aspect of it. Um, and then when you have a bad album cover like this with a stupid title called Hey Stupid and you spell stupid stupidly, um, that song was in for a lot of abuse as well. Um, and so this felt kind of like juvenile. You know, he's trying to make a cool point on it. It's, it's Alice's as you know wise father at this point um you know trying trying to correct a you know the the vagaries of the of the youth you know what else do we got in here uh, uh uh yeah burning our bit frankenstein was in for a little bit of abuse as well on on this um so so that's like a whole different dynamic than the uh than the than the poison that the late 80s you know, corporate power ballad thing and the ballad thing before. So you, you get a number of uh, a number of aspects of why one would ridicule some of this Alice Cooper stuff there. So so some folks or welcome to my nightmare. I never cry um, represented also by you and me um, and a little bit of only women bleed. But that was that was the best of all of those songs. And it wasn't really in for much ridicule. It was more like the metalheads were not happy having a song like that. But and then clones were all clones. Poison and hey, stupid. Good choices, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I mean, and, and I think a lot of those songs are just kind of brainless fun. But it, it's just interesting how you know Alice had this uh, reputation for so many years as being like the dark, ghoulish, you know, shock rocker, right? And you know, that's in, he always lumped in with all the the heavy metal stars of the seventies and the in the eighties, and he, a lot of ballads on a lot of those albums, right? It's like it's amazing how many he threw in from time to time, right. so. Not all as dark and menacing as uh, people make it out to be. So, all right, my next uh, choice here, this is a band and, and all the selections I have, they're either uh, covers that they did that uh, people just kind of savaged them on or 
just really, really poppy stuff, which was not indicative of, of the, a lot of the rest of their music. So Grand Funk Railroad is the choice. The first song is The Locomotion off the Shining On album. Strange cover choice, right? People still make fun of that today, right? But I think it's a hoot. I think I think it's a lot of fun. I, I love Mark's guitar solo in the middle of it. It sounds like they're having a blast doing it. And it takes that kind of legendary, you know, early, you know, rock and roll pop song. And it kind of, they give it their own spin. I like it. I know most people hate it, but I, I kind of dig it. But they've been taking shit for that for many, many years. Uh, my second one, we're going to go to the All the Girls in the World Beware album, which that album cover is reason enough to have it in this list. Uh, you know, all the guys with their faces superimposed on these big, you know, uh, bodybuilders and all like it's just absolutely ridiculous. But uh, the, the track, again, some kind of wonderful, another cover song. So this is an old John Ellis R&B classic, right? Now here you got uh, the Grand Funk folks giving their spin on it, taking them even further away from their hard rock roots. It's almost like the band got their little bit of taste of success or a lot of success actually with, uh, you know, the American Band album and then Locomotion was a pretty big hit for them. So they figure let's keep it going. So they throw this song on that album. They do a good job with it. Is that really what we want Grand Funk Railroad doing? Mm, that's debatable uh also on the same album they do another song called bad time which again sounds like an old 50s rock song like pop rock song early early rock and roll song uh it's just mark crooning up a storm do you guys want to be pop stars now i don't know so that's another you know thing that uh, all of us guys who were into grand funk back then were just kind of like what the hell is this looking back on it now as an older guy that's yeah, pretty cool song right uh the next album, Born to Die, which actually is a return to some heavier, darker, hard rock and stuff. But they got a song on there called Sally, because Mark Farner was in love with actress Sally Kirkland at the time. So let's write a song to Sally. Sally, uh, another breezy pop song. Kind of sounds like uh, it's got some really sappy harmonica on it. it. Sounds like California pop at the time, you know, like the really light. Fleetwood Mac stuff, maybe America, that sort of thing. I don't know, just no place on this album at all. And then last but not least, uh, the band breaks up for a bit. They come back in the early 80s with this album called Grand Funk Lives or Grand Funk Lives, however you want to say it. Pretty good rocking record. Uh, but you figure after not being, being away for a couple of years and you know, you're back together and you're writing new tracks that you would not want to include a cover on this album. But in true Grand Funk Railroad tradition, let's throw in a cover of We Gotta Get Out of This Place. And it's not very good. So the, the, the one kind of black mark on that album is the cover and it's late in the album. So yeah, no good. So there you have it. The Locomotion, Some Kind of Wonderful, Bad Time, Sally, and We Gotta Get Out of This Place from Martin's favorite band, Grand Funk Railroad. And then Blue Oyster Cult did that too, right? We got to get out of <laughs> Why not, right? Hey, you know, uh, maybe one of us will do the definitive remake of that song. I don't even know. Like we'll keep song, trying until we get it there, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, my last choice is Rainbow. Uh, and I found enough. But again, this is not a band that is, uh, that is ridiculed in a big way. Um, but it starts with a with two from this one from uh, from Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, uh, the song that started the whole thing off, "Black Sheep of the Family," a cover of a of a song by Quatermass, which doesn't even sound like regular Quatermass. It's just a it's just a dumb. It sounds like Elf, really. Yeah, um, and then speaking of Elf, if you don't like rock and roll from this album, as well, is highly ridiculed because it, it just sounds like a like a dumb rock and roll song. It doesn't sound like anything a Richie, you know, making this big bold statement that he's supposed to be making, which he does make on Down on the Silver Mountain and, and uh, 16th Century Green Sleeves. But those are clearly, clearly two ridiculed songs. Um, now, from this album, one of the, you know, definitely least ridiculed albums uh, in any way, shape, or form, um, Do You Close Your Eyes gets in for a little bit, little bit of ridicule on this. It's, it's the one that is probably the least liked song on. It's the least serious song. It's a little bit of a love song, um, which doesn't, doesn't fit, you know, this, the, the epic uh, amazingness of uh, those live shots, right? Um, and, and just, and that. Um, so it's the one that is is a little poppier, a little more straightforward. 
a little bit more commercial, accessible, kiss-like, all that sort of thing. Um, so that one comes in for a little bit of ridicule. I remember at the time, Long Live Rock and Roll doesn't really have anything that comes in for ridicule. There's songs that we don't like or whatever. I noticed in the comments when we did the first one, a lot of people just thought, these are songs we don't like. And then they started naming songs we don't like, they don't like, uh, sort of thing. And, and forgetting the idea that this is a little bit of us ridiculing mixed in with reporting about the songs just generally being ridiculed. So we're reporting on ridicule and we're, and we're expressing our own ridicule in a, in a gray sliding scale of uh, percentages, right? Uh, across all of this stuff, right? Um, but get to this record, Down to Earth, and it came in for some definite ridicule. Uh, the only thing that makes, or I, in my opinion, because I did a Contrarians episode where I picked this as my favorite Rainbow album, I'll, I'll argue that to the death. I love, I love this album. Uh, uh, it, it is my favorite Rainbow, but they were super ridiculed for covering Since You've Been Gone on here, uh, you know, also successfully taken care of by Head East, right? Um, but um, uh, definitely that was considered, uh, you know, a poppy bridge too far, as was the album a little bit in general. And again, Rainbow is too cool to be doing covers. They also got a little bit of ridicule for all night long from this. And then moving into the Joe Lynn Turner years, um, nothing really perhaps gets ridiculed. Just the general concept is a little bit ridiculed of, of this, of this uh, New Jersey guy. I think he's New Jersey, right? Um, you know, this, this American guy coming in with a, with a foreigner type voice and singing this foreigner type stuff. Up. So when when he does it the first or second time, you're okay with it. But by the time you get to this album um, and you've got Street of Dreams, uh, that definitely came in for a little bit of ridicule because there's a little bit of this um, self-importantness that that starts to uh, to you know take over in in a, in a roiling rolling sense uh, of the band. And you know this is my favorite of those albums. I always call this the the one that feels like a concept album because I think it's the most unified where where everything has has kind of a, a subtle cool artistic arrangement to it where the previous two they just seem to be all over the place we need one of these we need one of these we need one of these kind of kind of things to them um you know they are they are both heavier of course um but no when when you get to street of dreams it's a little bit of uh you know because there was a there's a can't let you go as well and there's a stone cold it's like a little bit too far and uh and all of a sudden the tide turn, Rainbow's not doing that well. They're not becoming a big band. Um, Joe is a little bit effeminate in his stage manner on stage. Um, there's a little bit of, like I say, self-importance to Joe um, that that he's just like, oh, he's just this cool, misty, sultry lover kind of guy, right? Um, and and it just started to get too much. So so that that was in for some ridicule. So there you go, Black Sheep of the Family. If you don't like rock and roll, do you close your eyes? Since you've been gone, Street of Dreams. There's also like a stubbornness to that album too, I think from Blackmore. It's like this, I'm going to do this regardless of what any of you think. Right. You know, it's like, this yeah. is just, uh, we want to, we want to, we want to have hit singles. We want to have a hit album. We're just going, I'm just going to do this. This, and you can't stop me. You know, Richie throwing yeah. a tantrum. It's like, we're going to do this. Screw everybody. This is what we want to do. Where else did he ever say that? Hmm, Blackmore's night is definitely a, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do it 20 times. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but meanwhile, in saying all that, but then he's like, Oh, how many million to get Deep Purple back together? Okay, well, see you guys. Thanks. It's been real. Yeah. <laughs> and we know how that worked out for him, right? So, yeah. all right. My last choice for today as a, uh, in honor of Martin and his brand new Nazareth book, let's tackle Nazareth while we're at it. So it's fresh in my mind after finishing that book. Uh, quite a good read and a uh, good viewing, by the way. Uh, so let's start off with the Captain Obvious from the Hair of the Dog album, uh, Love Hurts. Okay, this is a obviously an Everly Brothers song that all of a sudden now Nazareth has their first major hit. It's this kind of like, you know, ballady, mournful, you know, love her, uh, you know. Uh, everybody loves it, right? Becomes this big, huge single. All of the heavy rock folks are kind of like, you know, what the hell is this? But, you know, I think it's aged pretty well. It's become like kind of the signature track of all things, right? But, you know, back in the day, the people who wanted the hard rock from them were kind of like, all right, this is not really what we're looking for. And it's on a pretty heavy album, too. So go figure. But uh, once again, we see how the uh, strange choice for, for a single uh, on uh, these otherwise heavy albums do really well, because that's what hit radio is all about right uh next up we're going to go to malice in wonderland 
So here, very interesting reading in Martin's book talking about, you know, Jeff Skunk Baxter coming on board to produce the band. Of course, Jeff from Steely Dan, the Doobie Brothers, and they released this song as a single called Holiday which is a kind of a little bit, bit of a hit for the band, but it's and anybody who is expecting like a continuation of No Mean City, all of a sudden you've got this album and all these songs and specifically Holiday, which are like these slick kind of California pop song, right? It's just, it, it's kind of catchy. It's, you know, you got throughout much of the album, you got kind of like honky tonk piano. It's like, what's going on here with, with Nazareth? But, you know, the band, I guess we're happy with it and it sold decently, but I think in hindsight, going back, it's like probably that, that should have been like a one and done type of thing. And then they tried to do like part two of that on the follow-up album, which is not very good at all, but, uh, but holiday, good song. I mean, I, I kind of like it, uh, but it's uh, definitely at the time, not what any one of us wanted to hear from this band. Speaking of that next down the full circle, how about this weird kind of reggae version of cocaine? <laughs> Oof. I mean, has, com has Nazareth completely lost any of that heavy rock stomp that they know how to do so well? I don't know after hearing that. I mean, no good. That's very strange. Uh, then let's go on to two excess. So I, I got to go back to your book there, Martin. It's like, I think, uh, some of the things that are said in that book about the title and the cover are very indicative of the first time I remember going to the record store and seeing that sitting there in the bin. So it's got, you know, two X S not two times five, you know, two times S or whatever, all, you know, the fire and all this kind of stuff. This is what, this is going to be Nazareth back. The Phoenix is rising. We're going to take the Nazareth sound to limits of, you know, unlimited excess, right? Whatever. And then, most of the album is pretty light and dream on, I think was one of the singles from the album. And it's like, so instead of going to excess there, let's go to more pop, right? More pop directions. It's, it's a gorgeous song actually. Uh, but you made a great point in the book while everybody in the eighties around the early eighties are starting to get heavier. Cause you got the new wave of British heavy metal, all the legacy acts are like, all right, well, we got to rethink this. Let's get more heavy too. Nazareth's like, all right, we're going to go the opposite direction and get lighter. And it didn't work. And this album sank without a trace. And it's a, it's a shame because Dream On is a really lovely song. Our Love Leads to Madness is another great, great song. Uh, that was the other single from the album. So, but yeah, Dream On, we were all kind of like, ah, none of this. Uh, Snakes and Ladders album. Peace of My Heart. Let's remake a, a song that Janis Joplin made enormous back in the late 60s. Uh, it's a bad 80s remake of an old classic it's slick, it's sappy, it's filled with saccharine program drums. Band is clearly reaching here. Even Dan's decent vocals can't save this one. And you know, th that album in general was pretty ridiculed, but that is just a horrible example of why some of these legacy bands should not be doing covers, should not be doing them. So there you have it. Love Hurts, Holiday, Cocaine, Dream On, and Peace of My Heart. Nazareth. Yeah, it's funny, you know, they, they um. They, they could pick some bad covers and then they can just do them badly as well, uh, yeah. which is which is amazing because they're also one of the bands who's considered to have done some of the greatest covers and pick some very arcane choices. Remember that whole thing? I mean, they love the Crazy Horse album, right? And they, they yeah. covered three or four songs off of that and they wanted to do two others. It was really bizarre. So they, yeah. they picked a lot of weird songs and did neat arrangements. I'm the only other one I could think of because those were, that's literally my list as well, would be maybe Love's Grown Cold. That, you know, there are more there are more from that whole period there but yeah imagine imagine i always say this about rush too but imagine if nazareth would have put on the leathers and studs and gone super heavy in the new wave rich heavy metal they would have cleaned up right absolutely they would have been a massive band uh, yeah. had had just just snuck in a 1980 and 81 and 82 maybe an 84 in there that were that were completely heavy right because they were heading in that direction. I mean, No Mean City has got moments where it's like, all right, these guys are ready to go off the deep end with yeah. this stuff and just move into the new decade and be like, you know, the next big heavy metal thing, right? Yeah. And then they released Malice in Wonderland, which is like leagues the other direction. It's like, what happened here? But, you know, you, you listen- Three of those by 1984 and you're ready for, for the hair metal explosion, right? You're you're ready to be a huge metal band from '84 through to '90 as well, right? Yeah. So it's puzzling. Yeah, I, I think uh, to plug Martin's book again, it's it's a fascinating read because 
to listen to the guys talk about like the decisions they made throughout their career, uh, you know, with albums and directions of albums is, is really crazy. And it, they basically said, you know, we didn't want to keep doing the same things over and over for too long, but they, they always seem to go in different directions from what the rest of the world was doing. And it never worked out for them. It's like, it's just, it's crazy, but yeah, I, I, I I could just imagine what like a 1980 or 81 or 82 really, really heavy, heavy, gritty Nazareth album would have done business wise, you know, like kind of like taking like the uh, the framework of uh, Hair of the Dog and maybe Razmanaz or No Mean City or Expect No Mercy, but with like someone like Martin Birch or someone producing it. Right. And big, heavy riffing and no ballads and no covers. I mean, what could have been <laughs> yeah for sure what could have been yeah you know kind of like what uh kind of like what heap did with the uh Bominog album right i mean they're they i mean that album is pretty heavy even though there's lots of pop sheen on the album too it's it's very of its time but you know they uh, that's a way heavier album than the conquest album and they decided to embrace what was going on around them um and there's lots of other you know bands like like that but uh, nazareth were like nope we're not doing that so yeah Hey, and Abominog, it's funny, you know, it's not, you say pop sheen, but it's almost like there's pop songs, but it's, it's a gritty enough production and a histrionic vocal performance that it all sounds pretty rough and tumble, even when they're being poppy on it. Yeah, no, I think um, you're, that's, that's yeah. exactly what I mean. Yeah, because there's, there's great melodies on the album and there's yeah. hooks all over the place. And yeah, you got, uh, you know, in place of the, the, the big Hammond organ, like we had when Ken Hensley was in the band, there's more synths and things like that. But I mean, mixed guitar is like roaring all over the place on that album even on some of the, the popular tracks on there there's plenty of guitar there's plenty of attitude on there and i know there are a lot of people that don't like that album because it sounds so different from what came before i get it but i think that was the point um, but they embraced kind of what was going on in, in the world of heavy music and i think that was the important thing they did their own thing because that album doesn't sound like anybody else but it's it it definitely is fits in with the time and they basically just adapted and they said, all right, we're going to alter our sound a little bit. We're going to get even heavier, but we're going to make it musical and we're going to make it accessible because a lot of heavy bands at the time, their music was accessible. That's what it was all about. Right. So, yeah, yeah. no, no heavy, well, no I know heavy it's nothing. Sacrilege. Yeah. I, I know it's sacrilege, but even, even uh, we did one of our very first episodes of the contrarians. I picked, I, I argued that Blumenog is my favorite heap album. Um, just because, you know, I love that early stuff and the early stuff is way more genius, quote unquote. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but Abominog has just got this excitement to it that I just yeah. loved. Right? Yeah, so. it's it's a top five for me. I mean, I love it. I love Abominog. Yeah. So. All right, everybody, there you have it. Uh, more ridiculed songs by some very classic bands. And uh, if you think we missed any obvious choices from any of these bands, please uh, add yours in the comments below. And uh you know, we'll, we'll take a look and uh, see what we totally forgot on. And maybe there's some other bands that you guys might be thinking of that uh, have some, you know, really ridiculed tra uh, tracks. So put that down in the comments below. So, Martin, what's going on with the Contrarians, with uh, stuff in stock? What do you got available for, for people to buy? Yes, Contrarians. Actually, that's interesting because today I think Marco's going to put up our Nazareth episode. We just had a Van Halen one go up where Jamie Laszlo, who you know well as well, yep. uh, yep. legend, the legend. Um, did uh, for unlawful carnal knowledge as his favorite Van Halen album. We did a we did a worst album edition with uh, ACDC where Marco and I basically agreed on Rock or Bust as the worst ACDC album. So that went up recently. A um, few more planned, and then MartinPopoff.com for the books. I do have the Nazareth still. A uh, few copies of that. The Yes is all gone, so please don't order the Yes. And I've I've got the Heap as well. So MartinPopoff.com for the books. Cool. Sounds good. So thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Uh, coming up, what do we got here? So stay tuned uh, each and every morning for uh, another episode of the 30 most important albums in hard rock and heavy metal history. We've got day six coming up tomorrow. So stay tuned for that tomorrow morning. Uh, yes, as most people know, I will be away for most of the weekend, but we've got these things pre-programmed and recorded for you. So they'll be all ready to go. And then Sunday, we've got album homework assignments. So uh, we've got uh, Chuck Alvarez from In the Prog Seat going to get against Chris Canzanari from the Guitarist Corner. So that'll be happening Sunday morning. 
And then you blink and we'll be back with the Hudson Valley Squares on Monday. So stay tuned for that. A lot more for Martin Popoff. See you next week here at the Funhouse. I am Pete Pardo. Have a good one, everybody. Take care.